Exactly. Well, yes, indeed. We're focusing on the economy. We're joined this morning by the Minister of Finance, Mrs. Kami Adeosho. Thank you for coming on this morning. Good morning. Well, uh, speaking about the economy, I mean, of course, we know so many perspectives out there in terms of what's happening, what should be done, and what government plans to do. Perhaps start by telling us, what kind of strategy do we have? Do we have a national strategy to develop different faces of the economy? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. And we have a very strong one. Um, I mean, and, and to answer your question, I've first of all got to situate it in terms of what we inherited and where we started from, because I think it's very important to know where we are today so that we understand where we can go and where, where this government wants to go. We inherited, unfortunately, really, the, 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 for want of a better description, the worst of both worlds. So we've been through a period where oil prices were at their highest, um, and unfortunately during that period we did not invest. Not only did we not invest, we actually borrowed. We've actually, federal government has actually been borrowing to pay salaries for the last few years. So we inherited fairly empty treasury. And I know when the president said this, it was very controversial. People said, why are you saying that? But that's the truth. We inherited an empty treasury, and then oil price had declined. So we didn't have the opportunity of recovery. Oil price went from 110, it went as low as 28. That's the situation we inherited. Uh, we're borrowing to pay salaries, as I've said. Federal government owes contractors. So we came in really at the toughest possible time. Now, what's our strategy? We've looked back and said, where have we gone wrong? How did we end up in this situation? Because we all knew, that everybody knows that the oil price is volatile. So we all knew that we needed to take steps to insulate the economy against the possibility that the oil price reduced. Unfortunately, we didn't do that. So what we're now trying to do is to re reset the economy so that we never end up in this position again. And how do we do that? We have to have a more diversified economy. We have to have a more diversified revenue base. If you look at oil, it's only 13% of our GDP. It's 13% of the economy, but it represents 70% of government revenue, which means that anything happens to oil affects everybody. The question for me, and the question we're trying to now resolve is, that other 87% of GDP, why is it contributing so little to government revenues? If we're able to have those other revenues, which are much, much more stable, much, much more predictable, much less volatile, then if the oil price goes down, at least we'll be able to maintain some level of stability. So that's really our focus, to try and have a more diversified revenue base so that whatever happens to oil, we're, we're okay. And I think the other thing we're trying to do is to ensure that when government is spending money, it's spent effectively. We've looked at what government has been spending money on. Only 10% was spent on capital. Capital is what grows your economy. 90% uh, was spent on recurrent items, salaries, traveling, training, and so on and so on. Those things don't grow the economy. So are you planning to reduce spending on recurrent expenditure? Absolutely. This budget that, we've, we've, um, that, that is being finalized has a 30% commitment to capital, and we have said we want to maintain that commitment. Now, just for perspective, in terms of other countries, Ethiopia, which everybody now is saying is the wonder child of, 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 Afri of the African economy, it's actually the second largest by population after Nigeria did 60% capital when they were trying to grow their economy. We were doing 10%, and that's part of why we are where we are. You know, uh, um, unfortunately, that's the root cause of the, the situation we find ourselves in today. So we're do, trying to Do we have a target that. in four years? 30% is our, we're trying to maintain 30% capital minimum uh, as our, as our uh, target. And what does, I mean, let me just break that down and say, what does that capital, because we talk about capital, what does that mean? It's power. It's roads, it's rail, it's housing, it's the things that create jobs. Unfortunately, recurrent expenditure doesn't necessarily create jobs. Traveling to Dubai for a training course doesn't create any jobs in Nigeria. Building a house creates jobs for builders, carpenters, plumbers, then people buy the houses. Instead of being a tenant, they become a house owner. That's what uh, the, we call capital formation. That's what actually grows an economy. Uh, bridges, roads. If we have bridges, for example, and, and roads, agriculture in some, uh, some parts of the, the country become viable. You know, it's very important that this be stated uh, because we do know that, be, you know, in the past administration, there were, we had a very strong, a pretty strong finance minister mm -hmm. who was also uh, the coordinating minister for the economy. And 
it's not for lack of trying that they weren't able to save. Mm. Uh, you did see some of the controversies between the state government mm. and uh, the federal government as at that time. Mm. Do you think that is a challenge that you might inherit in terms of trying to persuade states on the need to save? I mean, these are states that you're currently bailing out. Uh, what has been the response to that? It's very interesting because I think it's unfair to say the states didn't want to save because I was in state government. The issues were around if we have these savings, this excess crude, then let's know you're saving. But we were coming to the FAC account, the FAC meetings, month on month, and the f balance was going down. I was saying, if you say you're saving for me, don't dip into it. If we're all saving, let's save. But if after a while you come back, the figure has changed, after a while people just said, okay, let's have our own money. Um, but let's talk about the saving culture and, and, and specifically about the governors and their, their will. One thing this has done, and they say never waste a good crisis, is that everybody is now extremely sober. Every Nigerian is sober. Every governor has realized that, wow, so this can happen. Oil price can plummet from 110 to 28 over such a short period of time, and we, could be, we can be so exposed that we can't even pay salaries. So there is a, a sobriety that has come in that I don't think we should waste. And we are working very hard with the states now. We've said to them, firstly, we're not bailing them out. We've said we will have a fiscal restructuring plan. Whatever we do is conditional. You must go away and drive efficiencies. You must go away and, for example, do biometric capture of your staff. Know who you're paying. Put in efficiency units. We've done it at the federal government level and we're seeing the level of, of savings that that can, that, can, that can generate. You must sign up to a restructuring plan. And if you don't want a restructuring plan, then we will not help you in any way. And that was the agreement that was formed at, at NEC last week, which was the meeting of uh, the economic team headed by the vice president and the governors. And all the governors are subscribing to the need for sustainability of the states. We can't continue the so way we've been. The, the funds that uh, the federal government gives to the states, the bailout, mm. is it in form of a loan okay. or what? So there were two interventions that this government did. And, and incidentally, I must say, they're very important interventions. People have asked, why are you bailing out? The, why help the states? States should go and sort themselves out. The truth is, outside of maybe Lagos and Abuja and maybe Port Harcourt, and a few other places like Ogun, Oya, if state government does not pay salary, nothing happens in those states. The state government is the biggest employer of labor. Over two million people are employed by state and local government. So once they don't pay salaries, economic activity stops. And part of the slowdown that we're seeing, people don't get salaries, they don't pay their landlord, landlord can't pay school fees. So the, the knock-on effect, the multiplier effect of that is considerable. We believe we're trying to stimulate this economy. You cannot stimulate an economy if two million people the largest single employer of labor across the nation cannot pay salaries. It doesn't, it, it won't work. Well, Be but, but yeah. uh, sorry to cut you there, but it must has to, uh, have to stop. You don't have to continue uh, giving them bailout mm. uh, because what is happening now, we, we just might liken it to what happened when President Obama uh, came on board in the United States. Uh, he had to bail out a lot of big firms and mm. big companies mm. and even some of those banks. But we're talking about a system whereby some of the states have been bailed out and now they're asking for more money. Mm. When will it stop? Right. And that's where the fiscal sustainability plan comes in. We're saying it's conditional. You will sign up and to say, this is my headcount target. My, I must not spend more than X percentage of my revenue on salaries. I must not grow my overhead by this amount. So we're making it conditional and, and they will sign up. You see, to adjust an economy takes time. A, a, a governor cannot just come in. I, I know one of the commentators said it should just sack people. These are, these are human beings. These are, these are people who have a responsibility. So even if you want to gradually reduce headcount, there's a way to do it. But the first thing is, who are you even paying? Do you even know who your staff are? In many cases, and we've done this, we, we found ghost workers. We know there are ghost workers at stake. So clean house first. Understand what your true salary bill is. Is it sustainable? Do I have enough IGR to... with uh, the federal allocation, do I have enough IGR to meet my expenses? These are things that you and I, all of us do in how we manage our own personal finances. We're saying, do your housekeeping. That's a condition of, and it's not a bailout, it's a restructured loan. That's what we've done. Uh, we're also looking at the fact that, and, and the state governments have, have made this point, and it is a, in many cases a very valid point, that the federal government owes, federal government owes the states money in, in many cases. In many cases, the federal government has not done maintain federal roads, in many states, uh, and including the one that I, I was privileged to serve in, police, for example, is a federal government function. All the vehicles were provided by the state government. 
running cost fuel was being provided by state, and this is being replicated across so, the country. Are those sort of some sort of payback to the state? Well, no, that? because what we think is that, and this is the fundamental: if we get federal government working properly, state governments then focus on what you are supposed to be focusing on, and then the system begins to work. Then local government focus on what you are supposed to be focusing on. But you know how it is: people don't belong to the federation; they they live in a state. And if there are no services, they shout. And so people have to do something. And the nearest tier of government is the state governments. So there's a tendency for the state governments, and they've been doing this, go and borrow money to fix a federal bridge. No. Let's get the federal government to do the federal government's job, then the state government should do the state government jobs, and then let's separate responsibilities and have proper financial relationships. I think, I, I between think, the I two. think that's what uh, federation is about. Uh, everyone knows his or her job mm. at the end of the day. But I want to go back to the budget. It looks like a there's some, of, some form of good news coming to you or coming to the country. The budget was pegged at uh, $38 yeah. a barrel, but uh, it seemed that uh, we l we're witnessing some form of increase mm. at the moment. It's gone up uh, ab to about $40 mm. a barrel. Mm. And if it stays there or it goes, goes up again, uh, which is uh, another good news for us, are you thinking of what we're likely to do with uh, the excess that comes out of it? I... I I get very uncomfortable when people start hoping on the oil price. That's exactly why we are where we are. When it was 110, what did we do with the excess? We have nothing to show for it. And because uh, so I, I, that's why this question is important. Ask me about. Ask me th th about. That's why this question yeah. is important because now we, we we're getting to see that it's almost deja vu. We've seen this before. We, mm. We're getting to see that we're rising again. Yeah. So if uh, uh, the finance ministry. Uh, is looking in that direction. Nigerians will be concerned about what to do with the excess that mm. comes out of it so that we don't go down the road again mm. with uh, we were before. Mm. So uh, are you thinking in that, in that direction? Okay, let, let, let's say two things. We've set the benchmark price on an average of 38. So you remember that we've, we've also had 28. So even though I think it's 47, if you look at the average for the year, I think the average, uh, the World Bank and ASA maybe will average at about 50. And yes, there should be an excess. And yes, we should invest that excess. That, that's got to be the way to go. We must invest it. We must have buffers. How's the sovereign wealth fund doing? Which is one area that you know, um, you know, some money was put into. Yeah. It. Uh, do you intend to put some more money? We 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 intend to. The sovereign wealth fund is doing well. Mm. It's it's making investments. It could. It's going to do more. Um, we want to reposition it, and have it focused in line with government's objectives, which is this investments in infrastructure, because we've recognised that even with thirty percent of the budget. The infrastructure gap is so wide that government alone cannot bridge it. So what we're hoping is that the Sovereign Wealth Fund then becomes a, a channel to attract further private money, particularly from investment funds abroad, and brings more money into infrastructure. So we really want to focus the Sovereign Wealth Fund on infrastructure, on toll roads, on bridges, on power plants, things that will get the economy growing.